seems like over the last 10 years, maybe a little bit more, there's been a, a trend. Uh, you might say it was a movement. I would say it could even be called a fad. You see that there are these challenges, right? If you are at all active on social media, you see all sorts of social media challenges. Now, some of them are, are good. They're they're altruistic, philanthropical, to try to perhaps like seeking to raise money for ALS. It's a good thing. Others uh, are just really stupid, right? Or silly. Or as we found out, some of them are very dangerous to our youth, and so we kind of steer them away and try to talk to them about what their peers might be challenging them to do. But you know, whenever a, a challenge is extended, whether it's on social media or your friend daring you to do something, uh, you have a choice to make, don't you? Your choice is to accept the challenge or to shrink back and decline the challenge in front of you. And so we're familiar with these challenges maybe coming our way. And here's a younger version of me accepting the cold water. I'm in the cold water challenge and I'm gonna be doing it in my pool. And just so you guys don't think that we're wussing out here, here, as you can see, it's 36 degrees, and that's surface water, so I'm guessing that it's pretty cold. Well, we're going to do this Uper style. Since I always fish in the ice at first ice and last ice, I've always wondered, and I know at some point I'm probably going to fall in. So I'm putting on all my ice fishing gear, and then I'm doing the cold water challenge. Get the div overalls on. Always been curious what kind of mobility I'd have. In case I don't have any, I'll zip this up here. Doubting it's going to keep me warm. Life jacket just in case I can't move in this stuff. So that my body comes to the surface. And Stormy Cromer. Thank you, Hannah. All the water's being held in. <laughs> I now feel about 100 pounds heavier. Woo. It gives me a chill even today. <laughs> I was 100 pounds heavier with all that water. And, uh, you know, we just opened our pool, so there was a fine layer of algae. We hadn't got the chemicals balanced yet. You know, so you try to get up the slant of the, and butterfly with a life jacket. And, uh, well, I was as uh, athletic as I looked there, but... Uh, yeah, that was accepting the cold water challenge. Well, today we're not asking you to jump into a freezing lake or a cold pool. Instead, today we're asking you to consider a much different challenge. We're calling it the Red Letter Challenge. Maybe you've heard about this. It's been around for a while. It was written by a pastor, a Lutheran pastor, uh, years ago. And, and it's been a great way to, to challenge churches to look at the very words of Jesus. But before I get into the details of what the Red Letter Challenge is all about... I'd like to share this story with you. It's a story about an Olympic sharpshooter by the name of Matthew Emmons. Now, Matt Emmons was the best shooter in the world going into the 2004 Athens Olympics, okay? He was an American marksman, and the conversation going into that Olympic Games was not who would win the gold, because he was the odds favorite to win it without any real doubt. It was really about who might run or be the runner-up at silver and who might medal at bronze. Now, I'm told that when elite sharpshooters and marksmen do their craft, that they train their bodies so that when they shoot for exact precision, they shoot actually between their heartbeats beating, okay? Isn't that incredible? So if you can get your heartbeat down to maybe 60 beats per minute or so, you got about a second in between there. And so they do all sorts of training exercises where they do some visualization and they do some, some controlled breathing to help them with their sport. And as they calm their bodies, they're able to focus in on their target and make uh, the best shot they can. Now, the thing about Emmons is <clears throat> he was in the Olympics, excuse me, and he's going into his final shot. Um, Emmons just needed to hit the target to take home the gold, okay? He, he needed a score of 7.2 to be the gold medalist, 
and his lowest shot to this point was 9.3, okay? So Emmons took very careful aim, and he controlled his breathing, and he shot a bullseye. But the problem was, for one small fact, he shot to the target that was immediately to the right of him. That's known as a crossfire in Olympic shooting. A crossfire is worth zero points. He went from gold medalist to taking eighth in the Olympics. And as you can imagine, afterwards, he was devastated, and the press talked to him in a conference. And Matt said, you know, I was so focused in on calming my body down and going through my ritual that I failed to focus on aiming at the correct target. Now, I share that story with you because as Christians, I think we all could say we want to live for God. We want to represent Jesus in this world of darkness. But the more we try to be like Jesus, if we find that our intentions are reflected in this world as people seeing us as being more judgmental or as being a church that's divisive, or as people look at Christians and find us to be hypocritical or out of touch, if that's the reflection we give to people, then despite our best efforts and preparation, it's very possible we miss the target. You see, because there's so many different ideas of what it means to be more like God and follow Jesus. So what if we took the actual words of Jesus Christ, the red letters, as Anna said, the Bible, which many publishers take the verses of Christ's words and put them in a red font, right? What if we took those very red words of Jesus and studied them and then literally put them to practice? And so hence, the red letter challenge. And that's what we're doing over the next 40 days. We're studying the words of Jesus. We're looking for ways that we can be challenged to put them in practice in our everyday life as individuals and as a congregation seeking to go and share the good news of Jesus with the world. So over these next seven weeks, we're going to look at specific themes. This idea that Jesus, when he speaks in his words, they're kind of collated around general themes. One, one being, forgiving, serving, giving, going, and we're going to kind of close things up with what it means to be changed people. And so the Red Letter Challenge is going to kind of focus around three pillars. First of all, we're inviting you to be in worship for these seven weeks. Be here and hear the theme that Jesus is speaking about that week. If you can't be in worship, uh, catch us online, as many are doing right now, either, either live or in the replay fashion, okay? Secondly, uh, we're asking you to pick up a book. Um, apparently, I promoted this way too much last night because everybody picked up a book, and that puts you at a disadvantage. But what we are going to do is, uh, if you're interested, put your email up there. We'll make sure you get the pages for this week, and we will have fresh books here guaranteed next weekend. Plus, this is going to be a house copy, okay? If you don't do email, just come to church sometime with your morning coffee, and you can read. It takes five minutes. It's like three or four pages. And the font, you know, for those of you who really like reading, that's a good font, right? You know, it's pretty big. So um, that's another part of the challenge. Just get into the book. And then we're also encouraging people to, to perhaps join a group. We have another small group that still has plenty of room in it. We have a group that starts here uh, that's more of a large group in our Bible study time, a little different feature of it. But those are different ways. Maybe you just want to get together with some people who you know and just talk about the book. That's a small group in itself. It doesn't have to be something organized. So those are the three involvements to it. And today as we intro this Red Letter Challenge, we're calling this message, Meeting the Challenge. And as we are meeting the challenge, that's a double entendre, a double meaning, because in one sense, we are meeting the challenge because we're meeting it like a first date, getting familiarized with it for the first time, seeing what it's all about. We'll look at the short five little synapses of, of, of what the challenge is all about in just a minute. But also, we're meeting the challenge in the sense that when you're up to the challenge, you meet the challenge, you're ready to take it on. And so that's kind of what we're looking at as we look at the red letter challenge. And so these five major themes that we're going to look at with intentionality each week start off with this idea of being. I think so often we, as people of action, want to jump to what do I have to do? Let's get to doing. What's the step? What's the action step? But 
It's interesting how much Jesus talked about just being, being with the Savior, being in a relationship with our God, being the people that he formed us to be, being the followers of Christ he designed us to be. And so in this week, we're going to talk about how we are invited just to be the children of God, how we have been claimed as God's children through the waters of holy baptism. Jesus himself says, come to me, all of you who are heavy, are weary and heavy burdened, and I'll give you rest. Maybe you're weary today. Maybe you're burdened. Maybe you're not, but I'm sure you can identify times in your life where that applies to you. He says, you don't have to do anything. Just be with me, and I will give you rest. And I think as Christians, we have to recognize that before we can do anything of significance for our God. We need to spend time being with our God, being the people he's called us to be and understanding our identity, knowing who we are in Christ, knowing whose we are as God's treasured possession. And so that's kind of a crucial foundation. Jesus talks a lot about just being with him, whether he's talking to Mary and Martha or in several other times with his disciples. You know, another theme that's very prevalent in the words of Christ, this shouldn't surprise you, is that he talked a lot about forgiveness, didn't he? In fact, forgiveness was a big part of Jesus' preaching and teaching. His disciple Peter once asked him, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? And he gives the rabbinic answer. You know, most people might think, well, maybe two or three times, you know, fool me once type of thinking. But Peter thinks he's really kind of going over the edge and saying, you know, like the rabbis teach, I'm willing to do it up to seven times. Jesus answers him and says, well, Peter, seven isn't the limit. Not seven, but 77 times. And of course, Christ isn't coming up with a specific number of times we should forgive somebody, but he's saying we should always be willing to forgive. And so that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to be talking about how forgiveness comes in Christ. How forgiveness is offered to us through the blood shed on the cross. And how we are personally forgiven of our sins. But then we're going to talk about how that forgiveness permeates into our lives with our relationships with others. And we'll probably challenge ourselves with some hard topics. You know, so there's some hard things dealing with forgiveness, isn't there? Like... How do I forgive myself? Or how do I forgive somebody else that's hurt me? So we'll look to those red letters of Jesus to kind of dive into that. Jesus goes on to speak throughout his words of the Gospels, and he talks a lot about being a servant. And so in week three here, week four, I guess, with the intro, we'll be looking at what it means to serve. Jesus says that the Son of Man, that was a title he used most frequently for himself, did not come to be served. He didn't come to be a king in a king's palace where he had his court jester, his court servant, his court musician, his court whatever. No, he says, that's not how I ran. I came not to be served, but to serve myself. My my ultimate level or act of service would be to give my life as a ransom for many. So we're going to look a little more deeply into what it means to be servants of Christ. I'm sure you're like me. There's times in your life where somebody asks you to do something. Maybe you're tired. Maybe you just don't feel like doing it. Or maybe you know you should do it, but your heart's not right. You don't really want to do it. Maybe you groan inwardly, or maybe you groan outwardly when they ask you to do that. But we're going to look at the words of Jesus and see that instead of when somebody asks us to be a servant, of thinking like, oh, this is another thing I have to do, and Boy, this is filling my schedule, but actually think about how we're really being invited into an opportunity to be a blessing in the life of others. We talk about the different ways that through, whether it's serving events and mission trips or just being able to serve in the church, how that blesses those around us. Maybe even talk about how we as a congregation can be a blessing to those around us in the community. Because Christ talked about a lot serving those with the love he has given us. And he challenges us to be that servant as well. Another theme that shows up that we'll spend a week on 
which works nice with our stewardship time of year, is giving. Jesus spoke a lot about giving. Jesus spoke a lot about money. Jesus spoke a lot about generosity. And we're going to highlight those words, those teachings. You know, the idea that the more we spend time with God, the more we become generous like God. And in that most famous verse, John 3, 16, you know, you might think the key word is God loved, and that is a key verb, but look at the other verb in there. Not only did he love the world, what did he do? He, he gave. And he gave generously. He gave his son. He gave all that he had for us. Now, God doesn't ask us to give all that we have to him, but he does show us the limits of his generosity that are actually limitless, and he encourages us to become people of generous means. He encourages us to become more like himself, and as we examine the words of Jesus, we will find out and realize that followers of Jesus are not stingy people, but that followers of Jesus are some of the most generous people in the world because their model is Christ. But then that last theme that we have there is this idea of going. There in the Great Commission, it tells us to go and make disciples as we teach and baptize. Last week, if you were able to join us, we had our mission weekend. We do that every year. We had Pastor Farouk Khan, who was... Um, called to go out into the communities of the Dearborn, greater Detroit area, and to share the love of Jesus, particularly with, with people who haven't heard of it in the Muslim faith. What an incredible story he told us as he speaks of, of going in his context. But, you know, when Jesus talks about going, he's not just talking about going to all nations, but he's saying go to all places, and a lot of those places are right here in our context. So we're going to talk a little bit more about what it means to fulfill that great commission in our personal walk with Christ and as a church as we continue to hold up those who go to serve and share those words with Jesus. So I'm excited about these five themes, this idea of being and forgiving, serving, giving, and going, and look at those in, in detail. We will examine those and, and hit those five targets with bullseye precision each week as we seek to to follow Jesus. And I guess my encouragement to you is, as we as a church do this, give yourself some grace as we do this. Don't, don't look at this as a, a law-oriented endeavor, like what must I do or, 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 or what, what did I forget to do, right? Because, I mean, you know, there's a lot of things I forget to do over the course of a month, so imagine how many things I forget over 40 days, right? You know, and, and so if you miss a week in worship, don't beat yourself up about that. You know, maybe, maybe catch up on what you missed. If, if you get off the reading schedule, those bookmarks get you back on. You probably could read about 10 days and 20 minutes if you had to. All right? Um, if there's not a small group available to you or you can't make the ones that are there, uh, maybe you've got a couple friends that come to this church or go to no church or a different church and you want to talk about this book. That in itself is a, a small group of people at, can be very organic and loosely organized. If, you're, if you want to do something like that, let us know. We don't, we don't need to track it or anything, but if you need any resources, we can be a resource to you in that way. We want this to be an experience where we grow more in the likeness of Christ, but we don't want to leave Jesus behind on the journey. We want his transformative power to be with us as we absorb his grace and his love, his forgiveness that is there as we seek to be challenged into following his words. Amen. Let's pray. Well, Lord God, we're excited about uh, just looking at your words in a new way here over 40 days. I hope that in some way, Lord, we all just take something new from this and that it impacts our life in, in, in transformative ways. Uh, Lord, uh, we know that you're doing wonderful things through your church in this world, and we just pray, Lord, that we would continue to be a part of your redemptive power in this community and throughout uh, your creation. Uh, Lord, just give us your Holy Spirit and your love and your hope to, uh, to persevere as we look to what you are calling us to do and to be challenged and, and to uh, just seek to be with you throughout these 40 days. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.